Um, today um, <coughs> we'll be discussing a, uh, a thing that's of um, importance um, in technology and when we're involved in um, production of steels. Um, many of you are involved in research, right? So uh, you, um, you produce maybe steels in your lab. You mix a few compounds together and that's your uh, research material. Um, in the industry, things are a little bit different. Uh, most of the steels we produce are, are produced according to st standards. So everything is specified. Uh, not only uh, composition, but uh, also the, the properties are specified. The, um, um, the size of uh, what is being bought is specified. So you specify the length, the width, the thickness. Um, and so there are a multitude of specifications, right? So um, there is a need uh, for standards. One of the reasons it needs for standards is, for instance, if you are in, uh, in North America and you, uh, you want to buy uh, steel that is produced, say, in Korea or in China, which is uh, very common, uh, you want to make sure that what you buy will be uh, uh, suitable for the application, right? So you kind of agree uh, about the standards for, uh, for steel products. So, uh, so you basically identify steel grades by using standards. Um, and that is, allows you to guarantee uh, product quality, reliability, and also very important interchangeability. So, and usually they're very simple and coherent and convenient names for uh, steels and that make use of symbols or numbers and letters or a very often a combination of these. And there may be, uh, and that's usually the case, is behind these symbols and the numbers, there is data hidden uh, related to compositions, dimensions, mechanical properties. Hmm? Uh, so we'll be talking about you know, where standards come from and how um, uh, how, how they're generated. Some, uh, usually it's, it's, a, it's a mechanism that's pretty complex because uh, everybody has its, his say. Um, the, uh, of course, professional engineering societies have their say, trade associations have their say, government regulation has their say. Um, and, and you also have um, standardization institutes whose job it is just to standardize about anything, you know, from electricity to, um, to steel grades, right? So all these um, actors play a role in, the, uh, in, in standards. Okay, so let's, let's just um, look at a very simple situation, hmm? right? So this is somewhere a picture uh, taken in a... Um, uh, storage place. Uh, it's a coil ready for shipping and you can see it's, um, it's produced in um, it's produced in Korea here in Guangyang and um, you can see who produced it. Uh, POSCO. Let's look here. And uh, you see for whom it is. For some kind of company that uh, Shinahan Precision Industrial Company <coughs> in Korea. And you see here uh, a number of uh, letters and number, GIS, G3131, SPHC. Hmm? Okay, and this, this basically defines the steel standard, what's, what's in this coil here. Uh, and uh, it also gives me uh, the size of uh, the, uh, the dimensions, hmm? uh, width, the thickness, excuse me, and the width of the sheet material, the weight of this coil, about 11 and a half 
tons of steel. So what is this? Well, if you, if you know about standards, you can, you can directly tell what, what this is. This, first of all, in uh, Asia, uh, Northeast Asia, Southeast Asia, uh, because of the uh, historic Japanese dominance in, uh, in steel making, uh, we like to use the Japanese industrial standards very much, uh, GIS. Hmm? Um, and uh, G3134 refers to the standard, the booklet in which uh, uh, these uh, grades are described, if you want to. And the actual uh, information about the steel grade is in these four letters, S, P, H, C, where the uh, S stands for steel, right? So you know that this is a, you know, a steel product, not, not a copper sheet or aluminum sheet, yes? Um, P means plain carbon steel, yes? So uh, you know its um, property will mainly come from the microstructures uh, that you can derive from the iron carbon diagram. H means that it's hot rolled product, yes? And C stands for commercial quality. The commercial qualities are usually for steel grades are the basic qualities, yes, um, that where you have regular properties. You'll, you'll see in a moment what, what we mean. Okay. Interesting, always, uh, perhaps uh, background information. What does a thing like this cost? You know, if you, could you afford to buy one of these 11 ton coils? Yes. Uh, the price today of a coil like this is about $600 uh, a ton, so you're looking at uh, about $7,000 uh, a ton, yes? Uh, that's the worth of this coil. Uh, coils have very often uh, travel a long way, hmm? um, so how, how does the uh, getting a coil from the sellers to the uh, buyers uh, place influence the price? Well, that depends on, uh, you know, whatever you agree. Hmm? And so there is this thing called FOB, uh, which also influences the, the price. Means It means free on board. You always uh, have to ask what your counterpart means with this because it, can, it's, it varies from place to place what FOB means. Hmm? And in particular, it's... Uh, uh, in general, um, uh, FOB means that uh, the seller will pay transportation to the point of shipment and also the loading costs. Hmm? And the buyer pays transport, insurance, unloading, and transportation for wherever this coil arrives to the final destination. Yes? And you pass the risk or responsibility for the, the goods or for the, the, the coil as soon as the, uh, the coil has been loaded onto the truck or loaded onto the ship that will take it to the uh, purchaser. Uh, that's usually what's meant by FOB. In, in the US, uh, it does not necessarily mean this, so you, that's the reason why you always should uh, look into, for instance, FOB origin means that basically the, the buyer uh, will pay everything, yes, and take responsibility uh, for the goods as soon as they leave the, the producer's uh, 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 place where, they, where they're produced. You can also have FOB destination, and there uh, it's the, the seller who takes care of everything until the final destination. Okay? So the, very important, this uh, concept of free on board. Okay, right, so let's now go, go back to our uh, JES 3131, okay? So it's a standard, pretty much standard, hot rolled uh, carbon steel grade, yes? It's produced as plates, sheet, and strips, so you have different varieties, yes? Uh, and it's, it's a very common structural steel. Hmm? and it doesn't contain any special additions. So people build many, many things with this grade. Hmm? So as I said, in Japan, now it's called SPHC. 
Yes? In the US, it's got a different name. So there is a need for equivalency when you have... Uh, so it's known either as ASTM A36 or A283. That's big. Why do we have different names in the US? Well, that's because there are different trade associations who issue their, um, uh, their st uh, steel standards. And in Europe, um, we call this uh, S275. And the, uh, in Europe, a few years ago, uh, it was decided to uh, uh, not get rid, but have a European-wide standards for, for steels and other materials. And so uh, European normalization, EN, uh, uh, 10025 is the, 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 the standard that takes care of structural steels. Hmm? And here you have uh, S275. Uh, so these are equivalent. If you look into this standard G3131, uh, you will see that uh, there are subdivisions to this grade, SPHC. You have the regular commercial, as, uh, yes. You have the SPHD for drawing, yes. And the SPHE for deep drawing. Basically, these are hot roll grades, very similar, yeah. Uh, but uh, depending on which one you purchase, uh, you will be able to, uh, uh, the formability of the material will be better. Uh, how is this achieved? Well, you can see one of the ways in which it is achieved is by reducing the carbon content, yes? Um, right, uh, I just want to, um, before we, we go, and I'll come back to it in a moment when we, we talk about the European normalization uh, scheme for steels. Um, in, in Europe, uh, uh, they have taken great pains to uh, try to make the, um, the name, the, the grade uh, name, um, interesting, con i.e. containing lots of information. And so the S stands for structural, and the 275 stands for the strength, the minimum strength properties, the, the yield strength of the material. Okay, so that's... Okay, let's uh, look at an um, example number two. Uh, we're looking uh, in a, a steel yard here, yes? And um, we see uh, some stickers on uh, billets, cast, continuously cast billets here. And um, it's continuous cast billets. Um, and uh, we see on here Again, JIS G4105, SCM440, uh, that's uh, 440, yes? So we see here also the dimension of this billet, uh, 280, uh, 385 by uh, 360 by about a meter, okay? okay. So this is a cont basically continuously cast billet, yeah? Um, the material itself, uh, it can be used to make a wide variety of things, wire rods, um, and you, the, the in between state of the, the steel is wire rod, and then this wire rod can be used to make ball bearings, nuts and bolts, wire, tire cord, springs, depending. Hmm? Um, again, so we're looking at this uh, GIS, Japanese Industrial Standards, now the industrial standard is, so the, as it were, the booklet that describes all the grades is, is, is not uh, G3131, but it's um, uh, 4105, yes? And the, the grade itself is SCM440. What does this mean? GIS stands for S for steel, C for chromium additions, and M for molybdenum additions. So it's very different from the SPHC grade we just discussed, which was a co commercial grade with nothing really special 
in terms of additions. Here the additions are essential to the steel, and so they're in this name. Okay, so again, let's have a look at the, the name, the, this uh, uh, grade uh, specification. Um, so we, we started with uh, the JIS name, the Japanese standards name, SCM440. It is, so it's a common uh, carbon steel. It's produced, it contains chrome and moly. And it's, for, for instance, used for the production of hardened, high-strength bolts. Yes, and we'll, I'll, we'll go into the process of how this bolt is actually produced, yes? But it, the steel has to go through, uh, first of all, you need to make wire out of it. Yeah? You have to go through spherodizing, annealing, cold heading, mm -hmm. um, and uh, th that cold heading meaning forming the bolt or forming, uh, yeah? Uh, and then heat treatment hardening. Mm -hmm. and that's why uh, this, uh, it's essential to have this chromium and molybdenum in the, in the structure. Hmm? Right, if you were in the US um, and you would uh, purchase uh, that steel to make uh, bolts in the US, uh, you would buy an SAE 4140 steel. Yes? And if you were in Europe, hmm, you would uh, buy uh, a steel with 42 chrome moly 4. Yes. Again, um, let's uh, have a look at these um, uh, names here. First of all, uh, the European uh, norm. Yes. Um, the 42 stands for the carbon composition times 100. Right? So the actual carbon is 0.42 mass percent of carbon. Yes, that's very convenient in the name of a steel to, or, to already see, get information about the carbon content and to see in the usual uh, chemical formulas that uh, it contains chrome and moly, right? The way it is here. You can see that this was, it's already, it's also there in the uh, Japanese industrial standards, but without the R for chromium and without the O for of molybdenum, yes? But you can recognize the similarities. Um, do the, does the Japanese or the American, uh, uh, the SAE uh, standards give us some information, some clues about the carbon content the way the uh, European norm uh, does? Yes. Um, the in the American standards, usually the two last digits, yes, refer to the carbon content times 100. So uh, the SAE specifies for this, yes, a 0.4% of carbon. And you can see that the Japanese industrial standard follows the same approach. The two last numbers here refer to the carbon content times 100. So yeah. The additional advantage of uh, the European uh, way of writing is that there is one additional number, yes? And this additional number tells us something about the amount of chromium that is there. However, in order to avoid the use of decimal points, yes? in the names of steels in the center. We usually multiply the chrome content with a certain number so that that number doesn't have a decimal point. So if you have a chrome content of uh, one or less, yes, you multiply that content by four, and that's that number. Right? So this means chrome, Four means one percent of chrome, yeah. And if there had been, for instance, uh, chrome moly two, forty-two chrome moly two, uh, it it meant that the chrome content would be two over four would be zero point five. 
Right? So in order to avoid having this situation, so you don't write 42 chrome moly 0.5, yes? But you write chrome moly 2, right? Okay. The, the reason is to avoid confusion. Uh, remember, the standards are used because the, it's practical, for practical reasons, right? Uh, so if you were to order um, a steel uh, and you would, you would use this approach, yes, uh, there's a big chance that you would make errors, right? Because of the decimal point, because of the zero, the zero of molybdenum, the O of molybdenum and the zero of, uh, of 0.5, right? So in order to avoid that, um, it's an approach that's being used, excuse me, is used to, um, you use this approach to avoid the use of, of decimal points. Hmm? All right, well, let's, let's have a look a little bit at this steel, hmm? typical uh, compositions here. So usually the, uh, the, the, the specifications don't give you a single carbon content. Hmm? So if you order this steel, hmm? if you order this steel, you have an, an uh, SCM 440, you have between 0.38 and 0.43 of carbon. So you have a certain range. A product, a product will, for instance, have 0.41. Hmm? Uh, the same for manganese. The range that's acceptable, 0.75 to 1. Yes, and silicon and chrome and moly, the same thing, right? You, the, the, the specification give a range of composition for all the elements, hmm? and uh, and so and here you have typical applications, and. Uh, because you have a relatively high carbon content here, uh, this material is difficult to weld, and, um, and, and this also has an impact on the way you have to weld the material. You need to have preheating and stress relief annealing after welding um, to avoid um, uh, brittleness of the weld. All right. But if the steel is used for um, to produce a bolts, yes, the steel uh, that uh, will go from one steel producer to a wire producer to a producer of um, of uh, uh, of uh, bolts to thermal treatment plants, yes. And they may be very different companies, yes? So it's very important that they know what they're processing, yes? And with what they are producing these bolts, right? That is why the, uh, the use of standards is so important because material very often goes from one person to the other, yes? And you have to be able to know uh, what, what you're processing. And for instance, uh, uh, the billet we saw the picture of that was a uh, picture was taken so on the uh, billet yard of uh, Posco Special Steels. Uh, uh, that company doesn't make bolts. Yeah, that's made in uh, a f few companies down the line. Yes, uh, by specialized firms. So how does that work? Well, so when you make this wire rod, uh, this is for instance, the data here is for. Uh, comparable grade uh, with, you can see slightly lower carbon content but because now it's 435, right? It's, it's got a strength, it's, it's pretty strong, uh, 900 to uh, 1,000 megapascal. So the first thing you do is you, uh, you're going to soften it, yes? So, um, so that you can draw it, draw the, the, uh, the wire rod to the right dimensions. Hmm? So you soften it by a soft anneal, yes? Uh, this material uh, at 0.35% of, of, uh, of carbon, yes? 
will contain a considerable amount of perlite. Yes. So uh, in order to make it formable, so you can actually make a bolt, you uh, uh, so after the drawing, you you will spherodize the material and, and to make it very soft. Yes. 500 to 600 megapascal. So this is the spherodizing treatment. Yeah. Uh, uh, schematically, and then you can do the cold forming. And so the cold forming uh, involves, you know, uh, taking this wire, hmm, cutting it, uh, doing uh, steps such as upsetting and extruding this end, trimming the end, and then uh, rolling thread to this. Uh, bolt, and then this bolt is uh, is not hard enough to uh, to use as as a bolt in, in in practice. So you do need you need to do quench and tempering, yes, so that you have a martensitic microstructure. Hmm. All right. So this again to remind you, go, going from changing the pearlitic to spherodized microstructure is is a, a very common. Uh, uh, step, uh, uh, heat treatment step for products that contain a large uh, volume fraction of, of perlite, yes? And it's an in-between step. The person who makes uh, the billets or, or, or the uh, original wire uh, doesn't spherodize the material. Uh, and the person who finally makes the hard and very strong bolts doesn't sell a, a spherodized microstructure. It's an in-between step, yeah? It's an in-between step. You need to go through the spherodization so you can form the part, the bolt, or whatever, uh, uh, as it has much lower strength, okay? Uh, spherodization. We'll come back into the, in detail about the process when we talk about wire products. But the spherodization and the, is, is very much dependent on the composition. And you can see, for instance, that high chrome grades and molybdenum containing uh, grades of uh, wire steels will uh, will take a long time to anneal. And so uh, that's something that's has to be taken into account. Um, the nuts, yeah, the bolts here, are uh, not necessarily, uh, the bolts and the nuts are not necessarily the same steel grades also. We'll go back to this, but this is, for instance, composition of a, um, a nut. Yeah, the nut. You can see no chrome, no molybdenum, so you, you're basically looking at a very different material, okay? Okay. The, um, uh, not a good reason to have standards, yes, very well defined standards is exactly, are exactly these heat treatments. Because if you want to spherodize something or you want to turn it into martensite, you, you better know, for instance, what, it, what is my TTT diagram? What is my CCT diagram? How do I have, what, what do I have to choose my temperatures, my heating rate, my cooling rates, yes, to achieve a martensitic microstructure. Hmm? Or what is the best temperature at which to do um, the austenitizing. Hmm? And, and so for most of these steel grades, you will be able to find, yes, uh, these diagrams. And sometimes the, the, the steel producer will, will sell you or will, will provide you these, these diagrams. So this is an example here. For the 440, for instance, yes, and um, so, so, so it's a uh, CCT diagram, hmm? and you can see here, for instance, so it, it 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 specifies at what temperature you can do uh, different uh, processing steps, such as forging, annealing, normalizing. Hmm? Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Normalizing hardening. Let's like look at hardening because it's illustrated in the uh, in the diagram. Okay, so the temperature. Yes, you you see here. Uh, you can you can start at 820. 820, 800 is here. 820 is above 
the AC3 temperature, yes? So it's, it will be uh, homogeneously austenitic, yes? And then you can cool, and uh, with this diagram, hmm, you can see that uh, you will, the, uh, the transformation here, yes, will really start at uh, 735, yes? Hmm? And uh, that if you have a cooling rate of about 36 degrees per second, yes, you will be able to fully uh, turn the microstructure into, into martensite, yes? Okay? So that's another good reason to have standards so you can do the, um, um, the um, thermal treatments. A, another example, uh, now um, we are using, we're looking at an engineering steel, uh, AISI, and, and we're using uh, American uh, grade specification. In the US, uh, many engineering steels um, are uh, AISI yeah? uh, or SAE. So this stands for American Iron and Steel Institute and, and Society of Automotive Engineers. Yes? These are two um, engineering societies yeah? uh, that have uh, developed uh, grades, specifications, and standards for, for steels. Uh, so let's have a look here at uh, 51. 50, yes. Um, so you can see here, in the, as I said, in the US, the last two digits refer to the carbon content times 100, yes. And the, the very simple reason why we multiply by 100, because then uh, most of our uh, carbon contents, then the, uh, you don't have any decimal points if you have engineering steels, okay. Um, good, so uh, materials, uh, the S-cast material uh, is, is a billet. For instance, in this case, uh, you can see that the, uh, the, the name is not the same. Here it says SCR422. Okay, is this the same? Well, let's have a look. S, it's a, you remember now that this is a Japanese uh, industrial uh, uh, standards uh, denomination. S stands for steel, S stands for, uh, C stands for uh, chromium, yes. And in this case, because there is no, no other element, we say CR. So this is one of the confusing uh, things about uh, standards is they are not always logical. Mm? And they also use capital R instead of a small r. So, uh, but once you know that this is chromium, then you can guess that uh, this will be a chromium steel containing 0.22% of carbon, okay? okay. So this, they're basically equivalent, yes? So. All right, so this billet here, yes, um, uh, this uh, type of engineer material is very often used to make gears, yes? Gears, and uh, gears uh, go, uh, so you, you start with these uh, billets, yes, and uh, you go through uh, forging very often, or at least machining. So you machine the uh, uh, the uh, the gear, yes, and then you do uh, you do what's called a, a carburizing treatment, yes. You uh, because these parts are subject to wear, yes. You increase the carbon content at the surface, so you make them wear resistance, yes? And then you, you do quenching, yes? So at the same time, so you do the heating and the, the carburizing at the same time. You quench and temper the material, and so your final product has this uh, martensitic microstructure, yes? It's tempered, so it has uh, high toughness, and the surface of these uh, of this of the gear teeth is 
has a high carbon content, so you have a very hard martensite microstructure yes, that is wear resistant. The key addition to this all hmm, is, of course, you have to have enough carbon to have a hard, uh, strong martensite, but the key addition is the, the chromium content. Okay? All right. So if we look at the uh, just standards, and I simplify these things uh, heavily this morning because uh, I, I just want to, to point out the uh, most important aspects of these, these standards. Yes. Um, uh, if you look at the GIST standards, basically the, the types of steels are uh, subdivided in uh, alloy steels, carbon steels, spring steels, bearing steels, and uh, uh, if it's a, a GIST standard for steels, for materials, uh, you, they always start with an S, yes? And then in the alloy steel, you can usually recognize uh, some basic information. The, uh, if, if there is only uh, chromium, you said uh, SCR, this, this should actually be a capital R, yes. If it's a chrome moly steel, you see CM. If it's nickel chrome, NC, nickel chrome moly, and C, M, etc. Um, the, uh, the number here at the end, yeah, the number here at the end of the, the grade name is related to the carbon content times 100. Same thing uh, uh, if you look at the uh, AISI equivalent, yes, you see that the, there is meaning to the last two or three digits of uh, of the number. Hmm? Okay. So, um, so what, what I've done now is try to give you an idea why, why it's interesting to have uh, uh, names for, for steel grades, different, different names for steel grades, and um, uh, why it can be useful you know, when you transfer, when you're buying products, why it can be useful when you, you transfer one product through different production steps, why it's useful because you can get information about how to do third treatments on the, on the products, etc. So it, it takes a long time before your lab experiments can ever translate into an actual steel product, yes? Because very often before a, a product is accepted by the engineering community, i.e. the users, Yes, uh, you, you will have to go through a process where the grade is, is slowly being, be, becoming uh, a common uh, material hmm, for use, uh, for generalized use. But we'll come back to, uh, to, to this in a moment. Hmm? Okay, so let's talk about EU standards and um, in particular the uh, the standard 127-1, which is which has two ways of classifying steels. Yes. Um, there, there's one way. Yes, which first classification is 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 very interesting and simple. Yes, it consists of a letter code, a single letter code, hmm, related to where this material. What, what this material is intended for, the application. Yes? And followed by a number code. And this number code is related to the properties of the steel, the most important properties of that steel. Right? So that can be something strength, if it's a structural steel strength, the yield strength, or it can be Say if it's a, a, a steel that's used to make uh, transformers, strength is not that important. In that case, the number, that number will be uh, specific to the magnetic properties. If it's a rail, uh, that number is, will be uh, the hardness, right? So depending on the property, uh, depending on the application, 
that the number information uh, that follows the application information is, uh, is depends on the application basically. Hmm? So, um, so, so what are these uh, numbers? Typically, for instance, the mechanical properties. Usually, the yield strength in megapascals, that's in newtons per square millimeters. Hmm? Uh, and what are these application ladder codes that are used? In it? Hmm? S is for structural. Yes. D is for drawing. H is for high strength steel. P for pressure vessels. T for tin plate, meaning packaging. Yes. And M is for electrical steels. Yeah. So, and electrical steels, uh, meaning magnetic properties. So the M uh, stands for magnetic uh, properties. Okay. We have other specification, classifications in the European normalization uh, scheme for steels. And that one is basically one where the focus is on specific, on, on uh, chemical composition, yes? Mm -hmm. And we have uh, four important subgroups, yes? And these are identified by a letter code, yes? So C means unalloyed, yes? Unalloyed, or what we would call also a commercial grade, yes? And it has a manganese content less than one mass percent. Yes. Why, why do we focus on manganese? Because that's the, the most common alloying element, and that's usually the one that has the highest level of alloying in steels. Yes. So C stands basically for carbon steels, or if you want commercial steels, yes, and it's, it's basically unalloyed. Yeah. Nothing, yes, means it's unalloyed with a manganese content of uh, uh, more than or equal to one, equal to one or, yes, but less than five, between one and five, um, yes, um, less than 5% of alloying elements that's, uh, we use this second subgroup, X. Okay. For instance, I'll give you an example of this uh, letter code. For instance, in this case, yes, this is a European norm. It has only information, I already told you, about the chemical composition, yes, and there is no letter in the front of it, right? So, uh, uh, yes, so, and uh, in, uh, in, in the case that I showed you, I think the case I showed you was, let me redo this. In the case I, sh I showed you, this was a four, yes? Mm -hmm. Meaning that I had uh, more than four, uh, more than one percent of chrome, yes, in that steel, okay? So this, this one has no letter here. Okay. X means that we have more than uh, uh, five weight percent of uh, element, uh, of one element in the composition. And HS means a high speed steels. And high speed steels are very special steels. They're used for machining or, or, or tools, and uh, they contain very high levels of tungsten, moly, uh, vanadium, and cobalt, yes, to achieve these properties, yes. Uh, and they're, they're a group apart that we, and you can usually recognize them because it says HS and then something related to the composition. As with the, the, the best thing uh, to uh, uh, learn about um, standards is just to you know look look at what they look like in practice. So what I've done, uh, I've selected very common steels, yes, that uh, that are uh, used uh, worldwide yeah, as examples. Yes, so 
Um, and so perhaps when it's good for you to know that uh, the, uh, you know, for the quiz on, on, on um, Wednesday, I will focus, you know, if I ask any questions about standards, I will focus on the examples, yes? I will not ask you any theory of, of standardization, right? So, <clears throat> so uh, for instance, in the, the first classification, uh, we remember that you had an, uh, the name consisted of first letter, then numbers. The, first, the letters are for the application. The number is for specific property. Hmm? So in general, that's the theory, the name would be a letter and then numbers, one, number two, another number, a third number. And then you can have extra requirements related to that application. And these are, this gives you requirement symbols, yes? And then you can also have extra specifications that are, extra symbols rather, related to how the material has to be processed, yes? So these numbers, uh, these requirement symbols, and these extra symbols are not always there. They're just there if there is a requirement, yes, from the, from the user in particular. So for uh, let's give an example. Structural steel, st S. 355 means the minimum yield strength is 355, yes? Usually, it's specified for the smallest product thickness. So, uh, so, and that's why, you know, when you're in the business of buying and selling steel, yes, or you're responsible for actual, uh, as an engineer, you're responsible for actual contacts with clients and uh, uh, deciding whether a grade is good enough to be put on the market, you should, don't look at my slides. Right? If you work, you have to buy these, uh, these standards. Yes? So you know uh, what the specification tells you about, for instance, influence of product thickness on yield strength. Okay? Right, so um, this is the yield strength. Very often for structural steels, yes, um, there will be toughness specifications such as V-notch impact energy at room temperature, for instance. And then, um, uh, for instance, um, uh, N. And N stands for normalizing. So that means that the, the, the user of the steel specify that the steel has to be normalized, yes, in the normalized condition when it's shipped to, uh, to his site. So you know Perhaps uh, most of you know that what, what's this uh, Sharpie V-notch test. You have a, a hammer here that uh, uh, can um, spin around this, this axis here. You see this hammer here. It breaks open a, a sample here, a Sharpie sample. That's sample before and after the test. Uh, and, and the sample is located here. The hammer knocks it in the back, and in the process of destroying the sample, it absorbs energy. And you can uh, uh, measure this energy that's absorbed at different temperatures. For instance, if you have a sample cooling device, and um, and so what you usually find is that, for instance, for ferritic steels, um, you have a brittle ductile transition temperature, yes, and that, uh, for instance, at minus, excuse me, yes, at minus 40 degrees C here, the uh, energy that is absorbed when, you, when you're breaking the sample is 27 joules, yes. Typically, at, high, at higher, uh, above this transition temperature, uh, the, the absorbed energy can be much higher, right, 200 joules, yes. So, um, let's have a look. So these specifications for, for toughness are, for instance, if, the, uh, if you specify 
uh, say k zero, yes, means that uh, at uh, um, at zero degree C, yes, you want a minimum of impact energy of 40 joules, yes? And so, this is also specific. So, for instance, if you have um, a, um, in, um, for instance, shipbuilding, yes, you, you, you can have a vessel where you have uh, specific requirements. Uh, you say, well, you know, I want to have at least 27 joules of toughness at minus 20, yes, then you will have to specify J2, okay? All right. Let me give you another example. For instance, for drawing steels, yes, you will have D, yes, uh, D, L, uh, a letter, a number, a number, then the requirement symbols, and then extra symbols referring to processing, thermal treatment, etc. For instance, drawing steels will have a D, the D of drawing, C, O, 3, O, excuse me, the C here stands for cold rolling, yes. Um, O3 is a number that refers to the level of formability, yes. When it's O1, it is commercial formable material. If it's O6, it's very formable, and that usually means that you can achieve this grade if you have very formable interstitial free steel. What are the alternatives? Well, instead of C, you can have D, means hot rolled, yes, and X when it's not specified, when the purchaser lets you decide yourself. You know, it can be hot rolled, it can be cold rolled. Requirements. Steel, uh, uh, for instance, certain steels are used for enameling. Enameling, it means to put on an enamel coating, yes? Uh, so you want, for instance, you do EK for conventional enameling, or ED for enameling, direct enameling. Very often for co uh, uh, drawing uh, material products, um, we also, they're very often coated, yes, and you define in the, the last part, yes, the, in the um, uh, extra symbols, you define the type of coating, yes, and there also the coatings have a, uh, a symbol, OC stands for organic coating, that means a, basically a paint layer, Z for galvanized, Z of zinc, ZF for galvanized, that's a iron, a zinc iron alloy, so Z for zinc and F for iron. Uh, of course, then you can also have uh, references to um, quenching or treated, uh, uh, untreated or, or perhaps normalized, yes? So in the case of EZ here, yes, means zinc and the E stands for electrogalvanized, yes? So the coating is applied by uh, electrogalvanization. Let's now have a look at the other specification scheme that is uh, part of the um, uh, standards, yes, and um, the um, so we had four different types: the ones for letter uh, references, or for for letter symbols rather the C, uh, nothing, the X, and then the high strength, or high speed steels rather, yeah? So let's have a look at uh, examples. Hmm? Example, for instance, of the first one, C35E, yes? So C hmm, means that it's basically an unalloyed steel, and the 35, Usually, what you first should think about when you see a number in uh, a grade specification, it's probably related to the, you know, it's related to the carbon content. So that means times 100, 0.35% steel, yes? And the AN here, the alphanumeric uh, description E here, means that you have a low, guaranteed low 
sulfur content. Hmm? Um, then the um, uh, the second one is where you don't have any symbol. Hmm? For instance, one three chrome manganese four five. So let me perhaps write how it would look down look on paper. So one three chrome manganese four dash five. So this means uh, so there's no letter here. Yes, nothing in front. So that means it's um, the, uh, the amount of alloying elements is between 1 and less than 5, yes? So in this um, uh, notation, this is 0.13 carbon, yes? And then chrome and manganese content are specified here, yes? Remember, these numbers are numbers that uh, have been obtained by multiplying the actual uh, chrome and manganese content. So, so there is no decimal point. Yes? It turns out that the most favorable multiplication factor is 4 for chrome and manganese. So, so if you want to know what the chrome content is, you divide by four and you divide this by four. So this means that I have 1% of chrome and I have 1.25% of manganese, okay? okay? This factor, of course, depends on what element we're talking about because certain elements like boron we, uh, we have very, very small amounts of boron, right? So for boron, the factor is 1,000, yes? For elements such as molybdenum, aluminum, beryllium, copper, etc., uh, the, the factor is 10, okay? But what's important for you is mainly to remember the, the four for the main elements of engineering, steels, chrome, cobalt, manganese, nickel, silicon, and tungsten. Hmm? You can also get uh, in the specification that focuses on the chemical composition, you can find um, um, the third uh, class, which will the name where the name starts with X's, yes? And when it starts with an X, it means that there are alloying elements that have content more than 5%. So let's have a look at an example. Uh, we have X, 2, chrome, nickel, moly, I think. That's the one, yeah. Moly, and then uh, 19, 11, and 2. Yeah. Um, in this in the example here, there is sometimes you'll see a G, yes, instead of a C. Yeah, the G refers to uh, the fact that it's ingot cast, ingot cast. You know, uh, you can have steels can be cast continuous casting or by ingot casting, yeah? and that's a G means. It's a specification for the way it's, it was, um, it's produced. Um, so in this example, as soon as you have X in front of the specification, it means that you don't have to, these numbers are the actual mass percents. Yeah? So this means that I have 19% of chrome not 19 divided by four, yeah? That's what the X tells me. Don't use, don't divide by anything. 11% of nickel, 2% of moly. And this is, again, the carbon content times 100. So that's 0 0.0. And finally, we have uh, the high-speed steels. 
So they always start with HSS, yes? And, um, and they only have numbers. They only have numbers, yeah? So HSS2, oops, excuse me. Uh, for the example here is 2918, 2918, 2918, yeah. And that refers to the actual content of tungsten, moly, vanadium, and cobalt in that order, yes? Let me, so this, this is um, tungsten, moly, vanadium, and cobalt. All right. So, so here, for instance, we have examples of um, of tool steels, uh, steels that we use to make uh, presses. Yeah? So you you put them in presses, so you can form uh, plastics or whatever uh, metals. Um, so. Um, So uh, this is interesting. Let's, let's, this is a, uh, a, a so-called DEN EN ISO uh, specifications for tool steels. Uh, because of the uh, large increase in, uh, in tr uh, increase in uh, international trade, yes, uh, there's been a, a big push to try to uh, uh, align all the different uh, standardization methods. In the past, uh, Korea had its own standards, and of course different from Japan, right? Because, you know, uh, and the same in Europe, you know, you had even very tiny countries had their own steel standards, right? Uh, nowadays, uh, most economic blocks use standards, common standards, yes? Um, so here um, in Europe, we had very good British standards and German standards and French standards, Swedish standards. Nowadays, we use, we've, everybody pretty much aligned themselves on the German, original German approach. That's why DIN is the equivalent of JIS. It's going to be Deutsche Industrienormen means German industrial uh, norms, yes, and have pretty much been used uh, to uh, uh, develop the uh, euro norms. And then there we also have a, an international standardization organization, which is called ISO, <laughs> yes, who's also doing its best to uh, to get a global standards uh, in place. So that's why uh, you have these three uh, institutes um, in, that, in that name here. So for cold work, we will use, for instance, uh, that cold work is less, uh, the tool is heated to less than 200 degrees C. You have, for instance, a steel X38 uh, chrome moly 16, yes? So you already know directly that this is the chrome the car carbon content, yes? And the X tells you that whatever number you have here is the actual content of chrome in, uh, in this composition. Hmm? That's uh, hot work steels, um, X50 chrome, moly, vanadium, 5,1. So again, 0.5% of, of carbon, 5% of chrome, 1% of moly, um, and uh, each time I indicate some um, composition. Plastic forming, um, a steel that's very similar to the, the first one here, yes, with slightly, uh, yes, uh, perhaps slightly less um, uh, chromium, excuse me, uh, carbon. And um, high speed steels, this is an example here, um, uh, 652, yes. Um, and you see it contains uh, moly, uh, 
tungsten and vanadium and no, no cobalt. So it's not, uh, there, is, there is no fourth digit. Uh, and it, this should be HSS, by the way. Okay. In North America, uh, uh, they, they just like numbers, right? And so it's a little bit, uh, it's a little, it's a little bit more compact than the, the GIST norms and the um, uh, European norms, a little bit com more compact, but there's a, l there's a little bit less information in the, in the number, right? Uh, and so unless you're uh, familiar with these numbers, it takes a while to uh, discover uh, what the meaning is, be or you need to know what the meaning is behind the numbers. So uh, the basic form of these uh, American Iron and Steel Institute or uh, uh, SAE standards is XXYY or XXYYY. You know? And so the first two digits basically refer to the major alloying elements, yes, which are uh, typical, uh, typically manganese. Um, the, the major uh, alloying of manganese, and then the uh, they basically define alloy types from plain carbon to and carbon manganese grades to more hardenable grades, which may contain chrome and chrome molecules. Okay, the last specification, the last two digits, YY or triple Y, define the carbon content uh, divided times 100. Hmm? So let's first look at examples of uh, uh, low carbon steels with less than 0 0.65 manganese, 0 0.6 silicon, and 0 0.6 uh, copper. They will go by one one and then x, y, y, okay? So for instance, 10 y, y means I have less than 1% of manganese. Uh, 15 is from one to 1.6% 1 of manganese. 13, 1.6 to 1.9% 1 of manganese, yes? So you really need to know this, right? Because the number, the number really doesn't tell you. Hmm? If it's 1,1, one, one, it means so that you have uh, a, 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 a low amount of uh, manganese, yes, but you have sulfur additions. 1,2, yes, is, uh, it's a free machining steel, so low, low manganese, but with uh, a, you know, relatively high additions of sulfur and phosphorus, okay? So, You really need to know the numbers, otherwise, or what, what's behind the numbers, otherwise you cannot, you cannot guess it. So the last digits, the, again, are for the carbon content. So, so for instance, an example, XX40 uh, means that you have 0.4% of carbon. Yeah? And XX100 means it's 1% of carbon. Now, the plain uh, carbon grades are also subdivided in uh, low carbon steels, hmm? for instance, 1010, hmm? less, less than 0.2 carbon. Medium carbon steels, 0.2 to 0.5. So for instance, 1040 yes, is a medium carbon steel. Yes? And high carbon steel with more than a half percent of carbon, for instance, 1095, uh, yes is uh, a low alloy in, this, in the sense that I have low amount of manganese, but the amount of carbon can be very high. Hmm? And so what do they do in AISI and SAE uh, names when we have a one really important alloying addition, yes, such as for instance boron, you know that boron is element that's added for, to improve hardenability. Boron additions in the range of five to 30 uh, ppm, you will find the 
you'll, you'll see these grades as x, x, b, y, y, yes? And, and so this b tells you that it's a grade where we've added uh, a few ppms of uh, boron. Um, lead, um, lead used to be added uh, or is sometimes added to improve machinability of material, then uh, you will see this uh, if it's, if it's a, a material that's, uh, that has this, this lead additions, you see this L there. Hmm? Okay, and, and here are some examples with uh, a number of, um, so these, the standards are, you know, are box, yes? with many, many, many hundreds of pages, right? Uh, and at, when you first uh, read these standards, it's a bit confusing, yes? Uh, but uh, that's a fact of life. In th so the, the table I've used, I've only extracted steels that are very commonly used, yes? Because there are many books full of standards but a very tiny percentage of these uh, standardized steels are actually in production, okay? Um, so, so here you have examples of, uh, for instance, plain carbon steels. Plain carbon steels means, plain means unalloyed. So you, they, use, they will start with 10, 10, okay? 1044, 1045. You know, the important thing there is just the carbon content the, the manganese content, silicon content, is very low, less than a percent. Um, when you have a one, it's resulfurized, yes, yes. If you have a five here, that's high manganese steel. High manganese in the sense of uh, more than one percent. Hmm? 4140, hmm? now you start seeing um, uh, with the, the, the 40s, of the, the, excuse me, the 4000s and the 5000 series and higher, we're talking about alloy steels. So in this case, once you see uh, four or five as the first digit, you know you're into alloy steels, yes? And uh, you will get, uh, you, you should look here, yes? The main alloying element is invariably chrome, yes? The next most important one is moly, and, and, and the other one is nickel, yes? And these are, these are steels, these are what we call engineering steels also. That's another name, a common name. Um, and they are used because you can make heat-treated parts with them. Hmm? Okay, um, and, and of course the carbon content, you can see that uh, the carbon content is, is also higher. Hmm? We'll, but we'll go uh, uh, as we go uh, in, in uh, detail into this. I, one of the, the nice ones to remember, for instance, is 52100, yes? Uh, basically is an alloy steel. It has very high carbon content. You can see close to 100, um, to 1 percent, excuse me. And that's used to make ball bearings. And you can also see it has very high uh, chrome content to ensure that your ball bearings are fully uh, martensitic. There are other systems around, yes? The universal uh, numbering system, yes? I won't go into this, but you should know that it exists, yes? The universal is UNS, yes? Uh, you have basically a letter followed by a five-digit number, yes? And the letter identifies the class of alloy and the six symbols are assigned to the chemical composition. They don't say anything about the chemical composition. It's just some uh, steel has, composition has become relatively standard in the industry, yes? That composition is given a number, right? Unrelated to the composition, yes? 
and it ends up is you have big telephone books full of numbers and the corresponding composition. Yeah? But in general, they're subdivided in these five classes of carbon steels, heat and corrosion resistant tool steels, steels with specific mechanical properties, and enhanced hardenability steels. Okay. I will. I haven't finished. I had hoped to finish this uh, lecture uh, today, but we don't need to, to rush things. Uh, I'll finish it on um, the next lecture. Um, and um,